going to art, mm -hmm. what you said before about just having fun, right? You're just doing it, and that's art. But you're saying all this stuff like, you know, I'm using a major label, and this is full establishment stuff. Aren't you really, and you know, you're using a lot of breaks, but like, your rhythm structure is saying you don't want to play with the regular rhythm structure. Mm -hmm. right? Aren't you in effect by just having fun? I don't think you're just having fun. No, I'm not having fun. <laughs> Sure, I mean, that's, but that's me, but other people will, I mean, uh, my own personal take, I, I don't speak for other people, I always try and make sure you guys know this is my, Paul Miller's individual viewpoint, it's not the objective narrative of the late 20th century, whatever, just my take on it. Um, but in a way, like, there's a critical threshold that you get to the point where, all right, what, you, you're, you're working whatever medium, and you're like, right, what is the meaning of what I'm doing, how do I want to get this out? What is the intention? What you know? Most I would say a lot of people in general will just leave it at that. They'll make something and they'll get to just let it go. Um, I'm in the '70s. There was a kind of a crisis in the art world as well when minimalism was kind of fading a little bit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was John Dubuffet, but. Um, and the, the, the artists took on the role of the critic because they were so frustrated with the critics. And so you have the success of someone like Joseph Kasuth, who would start writing entire books about one you know, show, or someone like uh, Jenny Holzer, who would put her exact phrase that she wanted people to see up on a digital screen, rather than having the critic come in and write about it or something. So it's more like control of the perception of, my, of the artwork that I'm dealing with. And in New York, it's pissed off people. It's, you know, some people love it, some people hate it. <laughs> and that's cool, you know. I don't, I don't mind either way. I, I just, I like the idea of somehow trying to create a, a place where you can have a critique of what's going on, but also not go nuts, you know, because it's, it's a weird, uh, like I said, threshold point where it's you realize, holy man, you know, it's like everything I'm wearing is made of toxic stuff. Uh, somebody was exploited in Malaysia to make my shoes. Uh, I brush my teeth, and you realize the fluoride is actually really, you know, terrible for certain things, or. If I go to just walk on the street, like the amount of basic like pain everyone had to go through just even for the, this you know the city to exist, you know it's mind-boggling. But uh, once you get to the point where late 20th century, most culture is totally commodified across the board. What next, you know? And um, that's what I'm kind of trying to use my artwork to point towards is what is the next area, which is cross-cultural collaboration sending information beyond just the, your local geographic region, creating uh, art as a forum for different energies to go you know, out into the world, and stuff like that. Because if, at the end of the day, anybody can sample anything. You know, if you, but if you can't deal with the people who are from different cultures or use it to build a bridge, then it's just an empty gesture. You know? So like, things are so commodified that any time, that's why we throw field parties. Mm -hmm. like, any time you make a gathering of people that doesn't involve money as the medium by which you wish people gather, there are possibilities. Sure. Like, whether that's demonstration or a riot or something like that, or it's a party up in the woods. Right, I throw free parties in New York a lot. And I also throw parties that you have to pay for because it's just too expensive to put it on a loan. And, um, I think that there's room for both, and you can have free events and still have the police show up, no problem, you know, and you'll get a fine, <laughs> and end up losing a lot of money. I mean, I, I, we got a $3,000 fine once for a free event that we we had, you know, like we didn't even make flyers, we just put out a little voicemail number to show up at this parking lot, and we had boom boxes going, and the police came. New York is under Mayor Giuliani, I don't know if you got it, but he's just... They even have signs at bars, no dancing. If someone even kind of like, <laughs> yeah, the police will just so. <laughs> yeah, no. So it's. Um, you guys will laugh, but there's like in Vancouver, you have to have a license to dance in restaurants, in the restaurant where I work at. Yeah. Dancing, like we were told, like, you really can't let them dance. What's happening right here? So I mean, it's it's I've I've had events, yeah, where. I was, you know, the police, there's a party we do call abstract, and the police, yeah, the police and fire department came, like sirens rushing, 
you know, someone was dancing. You know, <laughs> you know, and, and I was like, no, I was dancing. And they, you know, they, I said, what is a dance gesture, to you, Mr. Officer? <laughs> you couldn't do it, though. Yeah, he, he was like, you know. <laughs> it gets to the point where it's, that's what I'm saying, interpretation wise, it's wild. No, but we got to find. And, you know, it was like pretty heavy. And we all had to throw another party to pay for the lot. <laughs> That was a paid party because we needed to pay the money. So, uh, any more? Yep. Um, speaking of regulations, what do you say to people who ask you about copyright? Mm. Um, to me, copyright is an interesting situation, especially in terms of late 20th century, because anybody can copy anything at this point if it's online, if it's uh, just a cassette, a CD, mini disc, you name it. If you can't copy it or craft the code to copy it, you can find someone else that can. You know, I mean, there's. Um, I like the idea of, of what they call public domain, you know, where it's like stuff just goes out and anyone can make copies. And uh, when, but without fear of retribution. I mean, there's a group called Negative Land that does a critique of this kind of stuff, and they've always gotten hassled. But just recently, uh, they, they had a CD that had, I think, a small fragment of like the Beatles or something. And the recording industry in the U.S. tried to shut them down by going to the actual <coughs> pressing plants and saying, don't. Uh, don't put this out or we will sue you to the ground, basically. Like, we'll just destroy it. But online, a lot of people started sending the recording industry's main office e email saying that this is fucked up, this is bullshit. And so they actually dropped the, the suit and let the CD go out. And the CD, lo and behold, hey, it didn't harm anyone, it didn't destroy the Beatles, you know. It's, <laughs> you know. And so I, I really think there's a kind of issue where it's what most people just don't get the idea of that sampling is more like a homage and it, it actually, like say for example when, when Puff Daddy worked with uh, Jimmy Page, uh, the Led Zeppelin sales actually went up, you know, the original versus the, the copy or whatever. It doesn't hurt people and in fact, we've, we, the US up until <coughs> only 30 or 40 years ago was kind of a major importer of intellectual property and Britain used to sue the US regularly for copying, you know, all sorts of stuff. and. You know, if you look at the blues and how that was appropriated, or even the way the U.S. was appropriated from the people that lived there, you know, it's um, it's kind of a, a weird paradox when, any, when any, anyone says, "Oh, I own this," or "This is my thing." I, I kind of think everyone is a collective producer, like we all share in the cultural process, and probably computer culture in general make that kind of stuff obsolete soon. I think because you just won't be able to control it. You can copy anything and change it to flip it around. I guess the issue is whether it's being used for resale. For resale? No, even if it's being used for resale, unless you can prove that it's the exact copy and all that kind of stuff. Like, for example, on my album, Rhythm Warfare, the last track is a woman singing a Buddhist mantra about recycling. And that's public domain. And the label was like, we could get sued by someone or something. And, you know, it just didn't make any sense. Because it's a mantra that most people with a certain sect of Buddhism have been chanting in their own way for for a thousand years or so, you know. So, um, all of these are issues that uh, I think should be questioned and somehow made to to be rendered in a way that's just like, hey, you know what? Anything goes at this point in terms of cultural production. But the corporations make a lot more money if they can make people believe the illusion that they have to continuously deal with copyright law along those lines of like, you know, you know, licensing and whatever. But at the end of the day, like say for example, Gardner makes his own mixtapes of video stuff and he'll, he'll just give them to friends or sell them at parties or, or you know, I make mixtapes I give away because I, I make money doing other things or something, you know. Uh, there's a way of trying to bypass most of that and in fact, it's a huge culture of mixtapes and weird sampler like exchange files, mp3 files, stuff like that online already in, you know, I'd say within the next couple of years, it's just like trying to, you know, applying copyright law, that kind of stuff, it's just like having water run through your hands, you know, you, you can just try and grab it, but it'll just go, you know. Can I ask you one last question? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm really, that'll be something I'm curious about. Um, you said that um, your art is a reflection of the environment, mm -hmm. and earlier psychosis and things like that. Um, and as art in the world, in all mediums, is kind of increasingly jumping into the global blender, like, so to say, um, dealing with appropriation.
collaboration and collage and pastiche like things we've already talked about. Um, how do you think that this reflects the human condition? Um, oh, yeah. so. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, no, no, that's a, that's a great question. How does, the question was the sense of entropy, basically, and culture and all the stuff flowing around and mixing and meshing. How does it affect the human condition? Um, I can only speak as a citizen of the industrialized, or at this point, relatively post-industrialized U.S., where uh, people just take most things for granted as accessible, that even a couple hundred miles away in the, the rural south, for example, is a problem, or... Uh, when you get to Mexico or South America. I mean, it's, it's truly a strange di dichotomy between the northern industrialized countries versus the southern, um, you know, quote unquote, third world. Whereas before the dichotomy was east west, you know, Russia, US, Russia's satellites versus the US's satellites, uh, it's now north south. And um, it's increasingly kind of a debate about access to resources. This is, goes back to the notion of price of access, like China is just now getting into cars. Like their whole thing is like, you know, status symbol, the, the, the Soviet uh, oriented like uh, bureaucratic types of course get the cars and the houses and everyone else is kind of, you know, left out in the cold. But the human condition, I really think it's getting to the point where we definitely have enough machinery to make food to feed everyone. We have enough uh, machines to, to clothe most people, to give most people shoes, a decent amount of food and a house. But uh, it's not happening, you know. And in a way, the dichotomies between the industrialized countries and the non-industrialized, especially when you remember that the bulk of the world's facing a kind of economic implosion at the moment, you know, uh, it's probably going to get even more intense. I mean, yeah, sort of Charles Dickens kind of Oliver Twisted return, you know. Oliver Twist, sorry, not Twisted. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just. Uh, <coughs> And it's, it's not even something, if you think about the actual impact of the economic situation on most people's lives outside of the industrialized countries, it's pretty grim. Uh, but even if they send aid in and food and stuff, like say for example in Somalia or Yugoslavia where they sent food in to these people who were desperately hungry and they needed food, the, the ruling cliques of each country would then take the food and the medicine and sell it to their own people, you know, and rip them off. Stuff like that, where it's just like ultra, <laughs> ultra twisted. But um, I have a friend, for example, we, we grew up in the same neighborhood, and she, she studied forensics, I think it was Harvard, and she, she, she has to go to wartime countries to determine what, uh, m what methods were used for mass murders, you know, so she'll, she goes in with computers and stuff like that, and just like, for example, she just got back from Rwanda a while ago, and she said, oh, they invented some new techniques, Paul, you know, I, was, I said, um, how do they, you know, what, you know, like, for, for covering up mass graves and stuff like that. And, you know, it's just the bulk of the world is living that way, you know, bottom line. And it's kind of the, the US or the Europe or Canada, you know, we, this, there's a kind of sense of unreality. You know, I have, I have friends here from Pakistan, for example. There's an artist named Shazia Sikander, she's a great painter. Um, she's, she's from, uh, I think, Islamabad. And, uh, she was just talking about, like, you know, in the capital of the city, you know, people with guns walking around, and, you know, like, if she's a woman not wearing a veil, she'll be stopped by the other Muslim, you know, men saying, what's going on? Or there's a, an artist named Sh uh, Shirin Nashat who makes video work. She's a great, brilliant artist um, from Iran. And she deals with Muslim fundamentalist issues in her work. And uh, the human condition, you know, viewed through the filter of these other people, you get a radically different picture than like, you know, Calvin Klein ads or, you know, think different, you know, Apple ads. It's, um, <coughs> it's a serious dichotomy and it's actually, I think as our role as artists is to try and <coughs> show different perspectives, not just accept what's already here and just say, oh, isn't it nifty that we now have computers? But uh, these are issues that, again, I, I can't speak for other people. I usually try and just deal with my own views on this stuff. So I think the human condition, it's, it's, we're definitely in some sort of late 20th century dystopia, you know, where it's like things that could have gone well. Yeah, I remember the U.S. was founded on sort of a utopian ideal, you know, like we want freedom, we want to be able to get under the, you know, no taxation without representation, that kind of stuff. 
So it was Rome. You know, Rome uh, was founded by the people fleeing the Trojans and all this kind of stuff. And it's when you get to that utopian thing that the usual, I mean, the, the worst excesses go out, you know, because people feel they're validated by the objective of whatever ideology they're working under, you know. So, human condition, uh, I don't know, it's, it's as we all see it. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, you know, we're basically, we're out of time because there's a class that comes in here. So, just before everyone leaves, just a, a couple of, of quick notes. I just wanted to tell everybody, uh, in case they didn't know, because I can see there's a lot of people here that uh, aren't from SFU that uh, we're putting on this ongoing series, Cultural Production at SFU. And the whole idea is we're trying to sort of construct a space where where some of the things that we do at the School of Communication up at Simon Fraser or, or uh, some of the more theoretical work can sort of find space with actual uh, people that are doing stuff like uh, Paul, DJ Spooky, or Gardner and EBN. And we're going to have an ongoing series uh, uh, of events. We're doing another one in a week on Saturday, uh, 10.30 in the morning at Blinding Light Cinema. We're doing a play, uh, The Fever by Wallace Shawn. And everyone's welcome. And in case you didn't notice, we have a little, uh, a little donation jar. And that's just so that we can, if you enjoyed this and you feel like putting in a few bucks, that would be great so that we can do more events like this. And finally, I want to thank Paul a lot and Gardner as well for coming in on really short notice and doing such a great job. I have one, I have one last question.